Take your Bible, if you would, please. 2 Corinthians to start with, being a number of places here today. 2 Corinthians in chapter uh, number 1. Uh, the guys have done deserted me here, so I'm going to turn here because it's already almost there. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. And reading from the big Bible here, uh, the Bible says this, For we would not, verse number 8, brethren, have you to be ignorant of our trouble which came unto us, came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, and so much that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Heavenly Father, would you please help us this morning? Please uh, turn our eyes upon Jesus and get our minds off of earthly things and onto heavenly things. Help us to see from the passages that you've pointed out to us that we need to understand, Lord, that you have this thing well in hand. Nothing has caught you off guard. Nothing has surprised you. Lord, all the people that are tuned in all across the country and even from other parts of the world that have become our friends uh, because of the internet and because of email and, uh, Lord, the people that have left messages and encouragements and things, I'd ask you might minister to them as best we can right now. This is all that we can do. We do look forward to the day, Lord, for the rapture, first of all, but then where we might be able to gather again here in this house, in this church. We recognize, Lord, that we have things to do still for you or you wouldn't have left us here. I pray now, Father, you might use this message to help somebody. And we pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, now's a great time for you to consider that when David, who had been a great king, passed on the kingdom to Solomon, you find an unusual thing. And most people will say, you know, if you got to have one prayer answered, what would you pray for? And they'd say, oh, I'd pray like Solomon did. I'd pray for God's wisdom, and then I'd get all the other stuff. So the motive behind praying that prayer was, I'll pray for wisdom because I want all the monetary things that go with it. But the fact of the matter is, is it's so impressive, and I realize that he can be a, a type of the Antichrist, and I understand it took him a thousand wives to realize one was enough, and I, I get all the mistakes. Again, easy to criticize not being in the position of being one of the greatest kings that has ever been. As a matter of fact, when the Queen of Sheba came over there, you know what she said? I've heard a lot about Solomon. I've heard a lot about his palaces. I've heard a lot about his uh, the, the, the places that he keeps his ponies. I've heard about uh, all these great and wonderful things. I've even heard about his wisdom, but he, she said uh, the half hadn't been told how great he is as far as his wisdom is concerned. I mean, who would ever thought two women are arguing over a child and which one it belonged to? Who would have ever said, well, I got a great solution for that. Uh, bring me your sword. Bring the baby up here. I'll cut it in half and give you each a half. And then to see the mom immediately say, don't cut it in half, give it to her. And then Solomon say, well, there's the mom right now. Who would have even thought of that as a solution? But you know what Solomon did? Solomon did what we need to be doing right now. Solomon said, Lord, I need wisdom right now. I need help right now. I need understanding right now. Lord, I need for you to grant me the ability to make the right decisions. Uh, we don't need an economic uh, uh, a blessing from the Lord right now. We don't even need, according to what the Bible says, for the Lord to just take away uh, the virus. Uh, look, I don't like having whatever that unseen enemy is, I think is the new uh, nomenclature for that now, whatever that little bug is, uh, whether it was uh, created or whether it hopped out or popped out or came from something else. I guess if it didn't originate in a, in a lab, then God made it and they just found it. I, I don't know, but I don't like it being around and I personally don't want to get sick from it. I don't want to see my wife get sick from it. I know that from what Miss Patty's sister told me this morning, I know that she said that when she checked in there, that the doctor in a short period of time said she's not going to be able to survive this. I wouldn't want to be that one of my friends, one of my loved ones, one of the people I knew. I did know Miss Patty, but I haven't seen her in quite some time. It makes it a little bit different. I don't want to be around that stuff, but let me say this, rather than praying for that, Lord, I need to know what to do. How much money to set aside? Oh, where am I headed from here? What direction do I take? What things do I need to do? Have you ever considered for just a moment this morning 
that maybe this thing is upon us to make us pause and recognize where our thought process has been changed into thinking into a more modern way of thinking. Uh, During the Civil War times, people were flocking to church because men were dying. During World War I and World War II and Vietnam and Korea, uh, people were coming to church because men were dying. They had one of the worst celebrations in the, uh, uh, in the country when World War II was over and it was declared that we won. Matter of fact, some of the pictures, maybe some of them even hanging in your living room, for all I know, is people running around with champagne bottles and wine bottles and beer and some uh, sailor kissing a, a woman out in the middle of the street and they're out in the streets and dumping out into the streets and pouring into the streets and celebrating the fact that uh, we beat Germany back with the help of the Allies and this and that and the other. And the celebration broke loose and the people poured into the streets and the churches emptied out. They still had the right to gather to worship. They still had the freedom to worship. But you know what they said? The war's over now, man. Let's party. Let's have a good time. I have no thought, none, none whatsoever, that if, if we were to beat this thing back or whatever, that we would probably take credit for something that God did, and we would probably forget all about the fact that we can't gather right now. We would forget all about, like the children of Israel, that all they did was complain because they're just manna on the ground all the time. It's just manna. Every day we wake up, there's manna. That means that's your food. Didn't cost you anything, didn't have to grub the ground, didn't have to plow, didn't have to pull weeds. Every day God provided for you. But they got tired of the same old thing, the same old thing. I'm not a prophet. I wouldn't claim to be a prophet. But I know this. I know right after the towers fell, however reason or why ever you think it happened and all the people that have given you all the thoughts and ideas about how it happened and Building 7 came down and it couldn't have come down and the Pentagon, all that stuff. I know this. I know that right after that happened because we thought we were in peril. We thought we were going to be under attack. We were afraid that there were going to be other bombing attacks that were going to take places in other places. The church is filled up. And then when all of a sudden the the desert storm and all the other things took place and we're going to strike back, whether justified or not justified, all of a sudden when they found out that the threat was lifted, the church is emptied out. It's an amazing thing to me that we maybe just should pause for a minute and instead of blaming the world and blaming China and and blaming the president and blaming the governors and blaming the mayors and blaming the law enforcement and blaming the doctors and blaming this and blaming that and oh Lord help us, we don't have a a ventilator. I think that was a thing. Or we don't have the PPP and we don't have, you know, that's the personal perception gear and that kind of thing. And we don't have this and and we don't have that and, and just constantly and then all of a sudden if we get through it without hitting whatever the number is, I don't have any doubt that if history repeats itself, we probably will be in the same situation. The Apostle Paul right here in 2 Corinthians, he said, Hey, I want to make sure that you all understand I'm an apostle of Christ. I love the Lord. I believe the book. By the way, in 1 Corinthians, I had a... I mean, excuse me, in 2 Corinthians later, he said, I had a thorn my entire ministry. In 2 Corinthians 11, you know what he says? He said, I was beaten of my own people above the uh, uh, 40 stripes, save one, five times. In prison, in shipwreck, and in peril, and, and so on and so forth. You read that when you have some time there. You know what Paul said? I just want you to know that I'm saved, love the Lord, believe the book, doing what I'm supposed to do, wrote 13 books in your Bible, and the Lord never let up, and I was not in the tribulation. But we had tribulation. Paul said we were under such pressure in this passage that we had this thought in our mind that we were even going to die. Well, certainly that probably is there now. Many people have forgotten that God is still God and God's the one that punches your ticket or not. I don't mean to be crass or crude with that, but it's God is the one that sets things up for you. If you would, please come to Psalms chapter 42. God is the one that is in charge of your expiration date. You can't tell anybody else when they're going to expire or what's going to happen. Now, if you want to speed it up, then you can do that. If you want to expose yourself, if you want to go hang out in a leper colony and and do those kinds of things and take chances and risks, then you can probably shorten your expiration date. But make no mistake about it, ladies and gentlemen. Nowadays, the book of Job is coming to life better than ever before where Job says, skin for skin, all that a man hath he'll give for his life. Isn't it interesting in my 
my own personal looking in the mirror, my own personal attitude toward myself right now is one of, wow, some trouble finally really comes, some real trouble finally comes your way, and look how quick you are to complain about what you don't have anymore. In my own personal life, seeing the lack of spirituality. Oh, let me clarify that real quickly. Because one of the accusations was is that I doubted God and I didn't trust God uh, when I said that we were, not, we were going to follow the orders of the request of the mayor and we were going to do what the law enforcement people ask us to do. And so somebody who doesn't have this kind of a responsibility immediately said, oh, you're not spiritual. Well, you know what? I have to agree. I'm not nearly as spiritual as I thought I was because I found myself thinking to myself, wow, Lord, what if it doesn't go back to what it was? Here is another thing. Why are you building that? See, I told you, you should have never built that. You should have never... You're, you're over there, they're still pouring foundations and they're still pouring grade beam and, and they're still got rebar sticking out of the ground and the tractors are still moving and all that. Oh, why are you doing that? It's done with the church. It's over. It's finished. It's done with. I don't know. Maybe that's an ark that once we build it, they'll pack it out full. We have to knock out the back wall between the sanctuary and the fellowship hall. Maybe you'll have more people than not. I'm not Mr. Negative. I don't see this as the tribulation. I don't think that we're going to have uh, troops marching up and down the streets and you're coming to churches with your ARs and your AKs and, and all that other kind of stuff, you know, strapped for service kind of thing, which is what one... Anyway, lest I digress, I don't know why God told us to do that, but He did. He knew this was coming, but He did. You say, what are you doing? I continue on with the orders that I have until He changes the orders. Well, certainly this is a change in the order. I don't know what He's doing. I have no idea what He's doing. All I know is He told me to do it. He told Noah, build an ark, there's a flood coming. And Noah got up day in and day out for 120 years and looked outside, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. The ground was being watered by the dew that fell and the groundwater that came up had nothing to do. He said, it's going to rain. What's rain? They don't even know what rain is. It falls out of the sky. Every day Noah would get up, stretch, get his cup of coffee over there, uh, get him a little grits and eggs and all that stuff and maybe a biscuit or two and he steps outside there with a little maple syrup dripping down off the edge of the plate there. You can amen that if you like. And so, and so then all of a sudden he steps out, he looks up and he says, well, it's going to rain, huh? <laughs> it's going to rain? Really? It's going to rain? There ain't a cloud in the sky. Never heard a clap of thunder. Never saw a bolt of lightning. And he says it's going to rain. And he says it's going to rain. And yet you know what Noah did? He continued to build until it was done. And once it was done, then God brought the animals in. He wasn't Tarzan standing out there on the bow of the boat up there and, and goes the, ah, 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 you know, kind of thing. Sounds like a charismatic singing. And then he jumps in and all the animals come in there running in there and they fall in there. No, the Lord brought them in. You see, what we can do is what we're supposed to do, and beyond that, it's God that brings them in. That's why I don't put pressure on you to try to force people and that kind of a thing. Let God bring them in. You say, why? Usually when God brings them, they wind up staying. When somebody else brings them, or if you have to have some gimmick to bring them over here, then all of a sudden, you know, when things get tough, and they do, or when sports activities come up, and they do, and when ball games come up, and they do, and when hunting and fishing comes up, and they do, then all of a sudden, you couldn't find them with a, with a stinking halogen flashlight. What if this is just the Lord saying to us, do you really love me? Are you willing to be with me? Can I give you five or six illustrations here? I hope to God I don't bore you to death. Look in Psalms chapter number 42 and look all the way down, if you will, please, in verse number 1. As the heart panteth after water brooks, so, my, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, here you go, where is my God. Where is thy God? Where's God at during all of this? Is he deaf? Is he blind? Is he a paraplegic? Well, where's God? Why isn't God around? I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. See, their concept, their idea of God is, is that when you're having trouble, it means that God's not there. But in the New Testament, and as David says in Psalm 42, the fact is, is God is with you as a real friend because He's with you in times of trouble, not just a fair weather friend. The God that we serve hasn't deserted you. He hasn't left you. He's not sitting up there saying, Hey guys, sorry I had to let you down because i got to bring judgment on the rest of the world or I'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. 
You know, for years preachers have been saying God was going to judge America for America's wickedness and when judgment falls on America and the rest of the world, it's like, God, why are you, why are you doing this? Because they're caught up in the judgment. There were actually saved people in the, t- saved people in the towers. There were little children that were alive and paraplegics and cripples during Noah's flood as well as at Sodom, Gomorrah and Admon, Zeboah. Just because the fact that we're going through trouble now and they may be asking where God is. I say He's right here. Well, it don't look like it. Well, you're looking for a manifestation of safety. That's not promised to you. Your safety is for your soul. You say, where was Adam when Adam was messed up over there in the garden? God was right there. God saw him when he messed up. God comes in Genesis chapter number 3. He says, where art thou, Adam? He didn't ask that question because he didn't know where Adam was. He asked that question because he said, where art thou, Adam? Like, Adam, do you know where you are? You're in a perfect environment. And you have a perfect wife and you have perfect food, and everything could not be any better, and now all of a sudden you're over here hiding in the bushes. You know what happens is, is Adam makes a really bad mistake, and he sins when he takes the fruit from his wife. But make no mistake about it, it wasn't his wife that made him sin. Adam messed up when he was in the garden. Where was God? Well, God still provided a way for him, so he messed it up the first time. So guess what happened? Adam now has a debt that he can't pay. Adam said that the Lord said, The day thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. And Adam's spirit died that day, the day it is. I know I heard all the arguments about, well, it's not really that that took place. And, and see, your idea of death is physical death. Adam died spiritually that day, the same way that the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 says, I was alive once without the law, but when sin revived, I died. We know he didn't die physically. He died spiritually. He said, and you who were dead in trespasses and sin, you aren't physically dead, your spirit is dead, and it has to be quickened or made alive. You know what happens? There's a debt to be paid. And the Lord said, oh, well, since you messed up, I'll kick you out of the garden, put you in hell, and I'll see you later. But no, let me just show you how God manifested Himself, even though Adam and Eve were the ones that messed up. This is what I love so much about the Lord is that even though at oftentimes we are responsible for the mess we made and our mistake, the Lord said, I'll still provide for you a provision, a way, a help for you to be able to get out of this. You say, what happens? The Lord said, well, we got to have a substitution. We have to have for you now somebody that can take over what's called in the New Testament a propitiation. You have to have somebody to take your sin. And so those little uh, lambs come out there, those little sheep. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. Yeah, but the type fits. Don't strain at the gnat and swallow a camel. And he calls them out there and he said, Adam, come over here. You're the head of the household. You're the spiritual leader of the household. And uh, you're wringing your hands and worried about what's going to happen and this and that and the other. And your wife is looking to you for guidance and direction. And and you're getting all your help and all your information from the internet instead of uh, turning to me and getting on your knees and asking God to give you wisdom. And Adam, come over here. I want to talk to you. I'm going to help you now. You're going to be first. But the first thing you're going to have to do, Adam, is you're going to have to admit you were wrong. And Adam comes over there, and you know the story, places his hands upon the head of that innocent lamb. That innocent lamb who probably a day or two before that was over there kicking around in the fields and playing tag with the butterflies. And that little lamb comes over there, pure, perfect, spotless. You've got to remember, before the fall, everything was perfect. And he chose a specific lamb, and he had Adam lay his hands on him. And as soon as he put his hands on him, the Lord took out the knife and slit that animal's throat. And blood poured out all over the grass and all over, animal, all over Adam's feet. And then he took that lamb and hung it up just like he would with a deer and stuck him up there between the little parts in his legs there and stretched him out, skinned him alive, or skinned him after he was dead and took that skin off of him and laid that bloody coat over Adam's shoulders. Same picture of what they did with the Lord. They... Stripped him of his garment. And then he said, Eve, you're next. And even though you led Adam down the wrong path, I'm holding him accountable for his sin and you accountable for your sin. 
And Eve came over there. I have no question, no doubt whatsoever. Those tears were pouring down her cheeks and she realized the mess she had made. And she's looking for a substitution. She's looking for a way out. Here's the great thing. God didn't desert them even when they were the ones that fought for it. They had a debt they couldn't pay. And the little lamb came out and the Lord did the same thing and repeated it for Eve the same way He did for Adam. You say, what would He do for you? Listen, if you're here listening today and you're lost via this internet, you just happen to be tuned in because you're with somebody who said, hey, let's listen to this guy and you're listening. Do you know what? You committed a sin and it doesn't matter who led you into that sin. God holds you personally accountable for that sin. And one day you'll either stand judged for that sin or you will be excused for that sin because you can have His righteousness. The Bible says all our righteousness is as filthy rag. You can't work your way out of it. You can't buy your way out of it. You can't attend church your way out of it. You can't be a good person. There's no moral way out of it. You say, what do I have to do? You have to admit it's my, it's me. I messed up. Not Lord. I wouldn't have done if it hadn't been for her. You know what you see right now if you pay attention very much to what's going on in the world and I don't recommend you do much of it at all because it's just a bunch of hodgepodge going on and confusion. You can't get a straight answer it seems like out of anybody right now. But you know what happened? Your people pay, well where did it come from? Where, what difference does it make? You got it now. Well who caused it? What difference does it make? You got it now. Well you know but we, we ought to hold them accountable. Okay but what are you going to do in the meantime with the collateral damage? You know what happens? He holds Eve accountable. You know what he'll do with the day of judgment? When you die you have your first judgment. You say why? What is that first judgment? It's appointed unto man once to die and after this a judgment. What is that judgment? It's not the judgment at the great white throne or the judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. It's that judgment on sin if you haven't been forgiven. You say what is it? You immediately go to hell. Do you realize people are going to hell right now? I don't know what the numbers are up now. Over 30,000 people, 40,000 people, one's too many. I get all the nomenclature. and Well, it's not the same as the flu. Oh, okay, all right, fine. You're, you're just parroting the politics of the stinking news. But listen to me. People are dying and going to hell. And more people today, more Christians are worried about their physical well-being than they are about souls perishing going to hell. The focus is on what about our rights and what about our freedoms and uh, are we ever going to be able to assemble again? And nobody's telling people, hey, you know what? Good time to make sure you have things right with you and the Lord. Good time to make sure that you're not like Adam and Eve. Hey, we messed up. Sin is a cursed word, uh, is, is a cursed earth. It's a, uh, we've messed up. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, you know what I might better do is, is make sure that I'm saved, make sure I'm ready to face the judgment seat of Christ, and I might want to try to get some other people in the ark. Instead of, um, you know, I'm going to the CLA or I'm going to so-and-so because I have a right, I have a right, I have a right, I have a right. You haven't been stopped from being a testimony to other people. What a great time to use that stinking social media for the cause of Jesus Christ instead of a cure or instead of a diet or instead of a joke. What a great time to say, hey, you know something? I got a hundred followers on here and maybe none of you know I love the Lord, I believe the book and I'm telling you openly I haven't lived like I ought to live and I want to do right. There's an atonement, there's a propitiation, there's a substitute that's been made for you. It's called the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And you know what he's saying to you right now? He's saying, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Do you think he cares one bit at all what's going on in the, in the sense of this earth is concerned? You think he cares about the here and now, the hereafter? He died for the hereafter, not for the here and, a- here and now, or he wouldn't have left the devil in charge. You know how I know he doesn't care what happens on the earth? Because of who he put in charge. 2 Corinthians 4 4, that the God of this world, that's talking about they have blinded the mind of them that would believe, talking about the plan of salvation. Listen, if you happen to be listening today and you're unsaved, you know what you need to do? You need to come to Calvary's cross, come to the foot of the cross, and say, Can I have the Lamb? The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's the first thing. And if you are saved, you know what the Lord will do? He's not going to desert you because you messed up or He wouldn't have put 1 John 1, 9 in the Bible. I better hurry. i got about 20 of these things to do. They had a debt that they couldn't pay. They had a thing that they, that they couldn't take care of. I've noticed this also, and I, I, I won't give you all the passages. In 2 Samuel, I just preached about this on Wednesday, or they ran the, the video from that, but uh, about Mephibosheth. You know who he was? That's somebody that was destroyed because of the, uh, the fall of somebody else. You say, yes, yeah, so what's the big deal? Well, there's a lot of people that don't come to church because of somebody else. There's a lot of people who don't recognize themselves as Christian because of somebody else. There's a lot of people who are always pointing fingers at somebody else. Oh, that person's a Christian. Oh, that person's a Christian. Oh, did you know about that person? Yeah, I knew about that person. 
But what about you? Yeah, but look at them. They're worse than me. That one went to jail. That one committed this crime. That one committed that crime. That one slandered. That one talked. That one says this. That one does that. Uh, This one comes to church and does that and then does this in the world. And I've got this and I've got that. You know what happened? There's people out there, even under the sound of my voice right now, you didn't go to church for years and years and years because of what somebody in the church did. The deacon ran off with the secretary or somebody stole some money out of the plate or the preacher, you know, got something doctrinally incorrect as he was growing, he messed something up and, and didn't do right. Instead of praying for him, you talked about him. You know, you, you don't have to preach. You don't, you don't realize what it is to try to run off a couple thousand words when you're up here preaching and that kind of a thing. But, but, but you can sure criticize him. I mean, stuff I said 30 and 40 years ago, man, good night alive. If I heard it now, it would make the hair stand up on the back of my head. I don't claim to be infallible. I don't claim to be perfect. I'd appreciate it if you'd pray for me. And Maybe one day when I'm about 80, the Lord will have fixed me and got me straightened out. But I do reserve the right to make corrections as I find out about them. You know what happened? That boy fell, or the nurse fell that was holding that boy. It wasn't his fault at all. Somebody had told him David was going to probably kill everybody in there. You know the story. If you listen, go roll it back for last week. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. But what did the Lord do? Even though there was an individual that was there, and even though he had been destroyed because of someone else, you know what the Lord did? He sent him a chariot. You know what the Lord did? He sent the king's chariot. You know what the Lord did? He sent another person named Ziba, the king's emissary, went down there to pick him up and bring him up to the palace. You say, what did the Lord do? He didn't desert him. Where's God? I'll tell you where God is. They uh, were Two uh, boys were in a foxhole one time out in World War II. It's an old illustration. He was out in the foxhole there in World War II. And uh, they were one boy trying to witness to the other boy there and trying to get him prepared for the end of life and of what happens if we get ready to charge and you die out of the trenches and, and this and that and the other. And they looked out over the trenches and, man, I mean, it was just horrible death and blood and guts and horses screaming and all that going on. And he looked out of there and he hit the guy on the shoulder and he said, yeah, well, where's your God now? And the guy looked out there across that smoke-filled battlefield with all those screams and hollering, all the wounded out there dying. And all of a sudden he saw two men with a little red cross on them right there running across. He said, there he goes, right there. There he goes, right there. Sending a stretcher to help the wounded. Sending uh, some people to get him some help. You know what, I don't, I honestly, with all my heart, ladies and gentlemen, I don't care who caused it, I don't care what caused it, I don't care how it got here, I don't even care if you don't believe it's really real or whatever it is, but if you have loved ones or whatever, you know what you appreciate? You appreciate the nurses, you appreciate the doctors, you appreciate the policemen that kept the roads clear, you appreciate the rescue drivers, you appreciate the ambulance drivers, you appreciate the people that are on the front line taking care when you have a need. And if you don't, you should. Instead of blaming them, they're going to take my guns or they're going to do this or they're going to do that. They'll be the first one to lay their life down for the rest of you. And you know what he said? He said, Mephibosheth is down there. Where's he at? Lodabar. Nobody wants to go down there. Indigent. No good for nothing. By the way, he was next in line for the kingdom. Why would you go down there and do that? Oh, you must be going to plan some kind of a murder, some kind of a killing and that kind of... He said, no. Is there anybody I can show kindness to? You know what God knows about some of you? You're down a load of bar today. You're so far gone. Man, I mean, you're down there. You know why you're discouraged and downtrodden? You know why you're down there? Because somebody destroyed you. You let something that somebody else did destroy your faith. You let somebody destroy your faithfulness. You let somebody destroy it and now you need it. You know what the Lord said? Okay, come on, get on the chariot. He's not going to chastise you. He's not going to beat you down. He said, listen, Adam and Eve had a debt they couldn't pay. I showed up for them. You got destroyed because of somebody else messing up. I understand that. Hey, guess what, Mephibosheth? Here, I'm going to do this. Why? For Jonathan, for my son, for Jesus' sake. I'm going to send you a chariot with the king's emblem on the side of it and the king's horses and a driver and I'm going to bring you to the palace. God hasn't deserted you. God's not beating the tar out of you. God's not whipping you for all these things. But some of you, some of you, you let God decide that you know what? I ain't going back. Excuse me. You let God, you hold God saying, God don't want me back because of what the deacon did or what the trustee did or what the Sunday school teacher did or what the preacher did or what the organist did or what the pianist did or what the violinist did or the celloist did or what the flutist did or what the trumpet did or the saxophone did, or what their wife did, or what their person did, or what did stand there. You know, the Lord said, hey, there's a chariot right outside. 
Yeah, but Lord, I can't get there on my own. My bitterness is in the way. My anger is on the way. It has crippled me so bad. When it comes to taking a step back toward the palace, I just, I just can't. I just hate. I just hate. I just hate. The Lord said, chariot right outside. Well, I can't get there. About that time, here comes a boy with uh, legs like tree trunks and arms like cedars. And he walks in and said, if you can't get there, I'll carry you. Time and time and time again, I've seen people and I've been there myself where the Lord dealing with me, dealing with me, Jesus is tenderly calling, calling today and calling me to step out. And I'm thinking, I can't go, I can't go, I can't go. I feel an opposition and I step out. And before I know it, I don't even know how I got down to the altar. You say, what is that? God's chariot. You see, you talk like a charismatic. Don't, don't uh, talk about it till you've tried it. It's one of the most unusual things in the world that the Lord would go out of His way after not just us messing up, but somebody else messing up that causes us to mess up. And still, you know what He does? He pulls a chariot out there. A little bit further in that uh, Bible, you go through an individual like the Apostle John. He got deserted on the Isle of Patmos. That desertion is a hard thing. You know what the Apostle Paul said? Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. You know what happens? Elijah's over there. He's by himself by the brook. He's by the brook Cherith there. And the Lord takes him over there all alone by himself. I know now of people. I had a, a friend of mine call me yesterday. One of our church members right here, Brother Chris, called me yesterday. You know what he said? Preacher, what about Brother so-and-so? Can I help them with this? Can I cut their grass? Can I cook them a meal? Can I clean their house? Is there? Can I get some gasoline for them? Tell me what I can do for them realizing, recognizing that that desertion, that feeling of being alone, of being by yourself, can be a bad thing. We have a lot of elderly people here that are alone. They're by themselves and they may even risk peril, whether those of you that are not in Duval County, believe it or not, they risk peril. Maybe even just going to the grocery store to get groceries and people have to pick stuff up and those kind of things. But that feeling of desertion, you know what he did for Elijah? He said, you know what? I'll tell you what I'll do. I realize you have some specific needs. You know what the needs were? Food and water. I'll have the brook bubble up and bring you water and I'll have the ravens come by and and I don't know. All I know is there was a famine in the land in that day and there was a drought in the land in that day. And so uh, Elijah was quarantined by the brook Cherith, if you want to bring it up to date. Elijah wasn't allowed to go out. He didn't have a vehicle. He didn't have a bicycle. He didn't have a store to go to. He was quarantined. He wasn't allowed to go to the drugstore. He wasn't allowed to go to the hospital. He wasn't allowed to go to the doctor. He wasn't allowed to go to the grocery store. He would be considered one of those individuals that were not necessary. I know some of you hate that, that you're not considered essential. I have heard more Christians say, I am essential. And the Lord said, uh, I want to see myself not be equal with God, but made myself lower than the angels and became a servant and learned obedience by the things that he suffered. I don't ever see Jesus going, talk about essential. What about me? Elijah must have been a non-essential person. You say, what? He wasn't provided for. Oh, well, I forgot except to tell you, God allowed a babbling brook and, and then all of a sudden, guess what? Somebody brought him food. What was it? Blackbirds, ravens, scavenger birds that you may not appreciate at all until the fact that that scavenger bird is able to go by the garbage can of somebody else and find some of the finest meals that have been left over and bring them out there. And you know what I know? Elijah must have had a smorgasbord every day for every meal because those birds are indiscriminate about what they pick up and Elijah could say, I like that, I like that, I don't like that and I don't like that. Now, I don't know that they ever found a way to deliver ice cream and I guess Elijah must have felt like he was in the tribulation but nonetheless, you know what I know? I know that sometimes we feel like God's deserted us. You know how I know that he wasn't deserted, that Elijah wasn't deserted? Because God still provided for his needs and he stayed there three and a half years. God help us if this thing goes on much longer. Because we're about five weeks, I guess, into this. And you know what I'm already hearing? We can't take this anymore. We can't handle this anymore. We can't do this anymore. Well, suppose that it's allowed to go on for a little while longer. Then what? You know what Elijah said? He says, listen, I'm over here because I, 
I'm all by myself, I'm alone. And he got some experience there. Not only because he was deserted, not only as we find out from Mephibosheth because of the destruction of somebody else and because of Adam and Eve, a debt that they owed. But can I say this to you? We also know a little bit further on that Elijah found himself under the juniper tree. I know this only because of the statistics that are coming out right now. You've heard some of the well-known doctors, and whether you believe them or don't, and they're in the, a conspiracy, they're a 33rd degree Mason, uh, they're tied in with a computer genius who's out of that now and developing vaccines, and, and all of that may very well be true, and, and they're part of Skull and Bones, and they're part of the Masons, and they're all, all of that stuff. They're well-respected uh, doctors. They got their pictures taken with certain people, and they're well-respected doctors. Doctors. You know what they're saying? They're saying that they're concerned that if people are kept cooped up too long, they're worried about depression causing suicide. One of the individuals, not one of the doctors, even said that the epidemic of that could be greater than the virus itself, which to me is a bit of a stretch, but nonetheless, here's my point. Elijah, who had seen God provide for him in a miraculous way at the brook Cherith, and with the woman where he took the biscuit and resurrected a razor son and saw fire fall from the mountain on Mount Carmel, that very man finds himself where some of you are today. Please allow me just a moment. I'm not going to tell you the whole story of Elijah. I have painted that story for you or told that story to you before, but could you stay with me for just a second? Anxiety, not knowing what what are we going to do? What should we do? Should we buy? Shouldn't we buy? Should we should we do this? Should we go here? Should we go there? Should we obey? Should we disobey? What what where where do we? All that stuff creates anxiety. Anxiety brings on depression because you can't answer the frustration comes because you can't answer the question you're asking. And Elijah has gone out and seen the firefall and Jezebel has promised him that he is going to die. And you know what happens? Oftentimes we think God's deserted us because we're human and we're depressed. I don't know about you. I've gotten accustomed to living a very comfortable life in the United States of America. I can go all the way back to as far as I can remember, probably around first or second grade. And I can say, honestly, really, I've never really done without. I know some of you have. It's not that we haven't struggled here and there and scraped together, but we've never gone without food. We've never gone without clothing. We've never done without necessities on a regular basis. But not knowing if those necessities are going to continue to come in, and if you see yourself as now I've failed it's no point in me being here. It won't be long before you know what you'll find. You'll find yourself sitting under the juniper tree. And guess what will happen? Depression and discouragement will overtake you. Well, let's just look at the Bible to see what happens if that happens to be you today. Preacher, I'm just nervous. I'm upset. I've lost family members like you heard about today. He's not the only one. We've had several that we know here that have lost family members to the virus. I've lost family members. My house is in peril. I, I realize I might be able to uh, to put that mortgage on the end, but I'm still going to have to pay. If my mortgage is one lady that told me, a dear friend of mine said to me, Preacher, I hope your folks understand that if they decide to to get forgiveness, it's not forgiveness that they're getting. That $2,000 a month goes on the end of the loan. They don't get that away. They may get some breathing room here, but it doesn't go away. The banks aren't going to just let that go. But there are people here, their mortgages are in danger. Their car loans are in danger. Putting food on the table becomes a big deal. And you know what can happen? It can seem that that problem is so insurmountable. On top of that, there's some that are sick, physically ill. Now, here's the thing in the environment that we're in today. If you get physically ill today, (coughs) you begin to cough. (coughs) You begin to cough and then... You go up some stairs and you can't quite breathe. In the old days, you know what you'd say? Yeah, it's allergies. 
In the old days, you'd say, yeah, it's the pollen. In the old days, you'd say, yeah, I ate too much and my colon is swollen up and my diaphragm's being pushed and my lungs are small and all that. But, but now, you know what you think? I wonder if I have the virus. And if they tell you you have to be, I, I'm fortunate I haven't had to be, but if you had to be, quote, quarantined, that means you can't leave your house for 14 days. It, it, it becomes almost like that cave Elijah hides in later on. So let me just give you a little bit of help. Here's what happens. Elijah has literally curled up. He's in quarantine again, and he's out in the desert by himself, all alone. And the Lord shows up for a dismantled, discouraged, downtrodden, depressed preacher who decided to walk away from it. And instead of saying like many of us do today, I'm done with you. He's the God of second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth, twentieth chances. And you know what he says? He said, Elijah, I can tell that there's a couple of things that are going on here, but before we talk about that, are you thirsty? There's a cruise of water by your head. Are you hungry? There's some biscuits on the fire. Do you need some rest? I'll watch care for you while you get the rest. Are you cold? Here's your fire. Do you need some direction? I'm going to give it to you here in just a little while, but you need some rest. You know what I like about the stories that I'm telling you is and what I'm trying to tell you is that there is no situation or circumstance you're in now that God hasn't been there many times before, and I'm trying to show you God never deserts you. He said, I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. A friend of mine sent me, as a matter of fact, Brother Yoakum, he's right here. Brother Yoakum sent me a thing today, a a message today out of Deuteronomy. You know what it said? Be of good courage. Fear not, I will not forsake thee. I gave you a message on that a few weeks ago. The Lord hadn't forgotten you, He hadn't forsaken you, and all that kind of stuff, but the things I've given to you to begin with are self-induced. If God doesn't desert you in times of being self-induced, why would you think He would do that now? This isn't your fault. The virus is not your fault. What about the Democrats? What about the Republicans? Who, who's going to win the battle for the money and who's going to get the money and who's going to get that? You'd almost think that money drives everything. And maybe it's the Lord going, look, the love of money is the root of all evil. Your focal point shouldn't be on whether or not I get a stimulus packet. And which side of the aisle you're on as to who's going to add what to the packet to be able to put in stuff or whether or not we're going to go green or not. But you know what you should consider? How's my situation as far as the Lord is concerned? I don't know if you've ever been defeated before, depressed before, discouraged before, like the the apostles out in Matthew 14 rowing against the storm and they get defeated. You say, well, what happened in that one? Well, the Lord just showed up in the middle of the storm when they couldn't row against the storm. He showed up walking on the sea. I think about that same storm there because in one of those storms in Matthew 4, if I remember correctly, Matthew 5, no, Mark 5, be Mark 4 and Mark 5. I have to get it right in my mind. And and, and Mark 5 is a devil-possessed man of Gadarene. You know what happens at the end of Matthew 14, and you come there in Matthew 14, it's the right-hand side in the top right-hand corner, after Peter walks on the water there and all that kind of stuff, which I I like that story because uh, when he's drowning, since I'm using D's, what does the Lord do? Let him drown? Pete didn't have the faith. He got his eyes off the Lord. He made another mistake. Would you agree? Isn't that a fair statement? Why didn't the Lord just let him drown? (laughs) You know what he did? He stuck his hand out. But lest I digress, you know what? If I remember in Mark chapter number 4, this is over on the left-hand side, the top of the corner of the, of the right-hand corner of the page there in my Bible. I don't know how it is in your Bible. But y'all come down through there and these little ships are in a storm there and the apostles are in a storm. And then they push up onto the beach there where the devil-possessed man lives. You say, preacher, you're going to tell me that even if I'm devil-possessed that the Lord will help you? There ain't nobody else that can help you but the Lord if you're devil-possessed. 
Since I'm using D's, let me just say this, that if you're demonically suppressed, or if you want to call it oppressed, but I call it possessed, if you're demonically gotten some windows and doors and gates open, and Ephesians 4 tells you about those things, and tells you that we are not giving Satan ground, and we're not giving Satan place, and we're not uh, ignorant of Satan's devices, it's all through that Bible. You know what he says? That even if you did that, the Lord has a way to help you. He watches that storm, and then he says, you know something I recognize? Maybe that guy can help me. Nobody but Jesus can help you. You see, here's the thing. As a preacher, I can't help you maybe individually because I don't know what's actually going on in your personal life. The only thing they knew about the devil-possessed man was is that he was cutting himself. That's a picture of him trying to get himself clean. Uh, that, that he's cutting himself. Everybody's afraid of him. He's got on fetters and chains. Maybe he's a prison escapee or whatever. He hangs around dead things and dead people. People are afraid of him. Nobody wants to go around there. He has supernatural strength. They don't know anything about it. They know what the illustration of the disease is. He has symptoms, but listen to me. All they know are the symptoms of the devil-possessed man. They don't know what causes it. Most people would say, he's crazy, he's ignorant, man, he's stupid, he's, he's insane, something's wrong with him. The Lord comes up and says, what's your name? And identifies the, the problem. When he does the diagnosis, he doesn't just look at the symptoms, he goes a little further so that he gets the proper diagnosis. He says, oh, now I know the disease. And this disease is a devil-possessed man. He's naked before the Lord there, beard dripping with saliva and, and, and Lord knows what's caught up in his beard. The rain from the storm before. He's standing there unashamed in front of the Lord, naked as he could be. You say, how do you know that? It's contrasted in the passage. And the Lord said, what's your name? And he said, my name's Legion. Because I got more than one problem. My name's Legion, for we are many. Do you ever realize that sometimes storms are for you to help other people? That the storm you're in is not for your benefit, but maybe for somebody else's. But do you realize storms also help you to recognize I got more than one problem? I hope this is helping you. I hope this is making sense to you. I hope you understand. I'm trying to tell you, and you should know this, but I'm just trying to biblically illustrate it for you. God hasn't deserted you. God may have may eventually desert the United States of America. Back in 1845, they were thinking that was bringing in the kingdom and all that kind of stuff because of a civil war in America. Listen, when the Lord comes, He's not coming to just save or destroy the United States of America. You're not the focal point of everything. The United States is not the cross bearer nor the standard bearer. We are not the banner bearer of what's going on in the rest of the world. When God comes, it's worldwide. He cares as much about the people that are across the sea in Australia where we have some friends down there and in New Zealand and in Portugal or we got people we got people all around he cares as much about them as he does the people here god may desert the entire other nations and may desert this nation but he'll never desert you the misconception is is because a nation is under judgment or under a horrible time of war or famine or or locusts or in this case it happens to be what they're calling the pandemic. Just we get this idea, oh well, uh, we turn it in. Why has God forgotten me? God didn't forget you. He may have forgotten the nation. The Lord said, I measured the nations. And He said, they are a drop in the bucket. And then He pauses and He goes, they're less than nothing. That's God's opinion of a nation, but not of a person. So you know what? This devil-possessed man, you know what he winds up? Bear with me, almost done. You know what he does? He gets some help because he realizes, you know what? I got more than one problem. Maybe you're a preacher today and maybe you're unsure, you're uncertain. Maybe some of the people you looked up to are doing something contrary to how you would do it or whatever. And you know what? Maybe some of you felt like because of what's happened and because I have a disease or a discord or, or debt or a divorce or discontent or discouraged or drugs or drinking or whatever. How about the darkness or the discouragement that comes from doing what God wants you to do and now the doors are closed and the money's not coming in? 
It's a difficult thing. I'm very fortunate. We've been here a long time. People are continuing to support the work. We're not beating the drum or, or, or begging them or pleading with them or whatever because the Lord provides, but they continue. But, but just suppose, just suppose you're like Jeremiah was. He's preaching and all he does is get put in jail for it. Not for stupidity. He got put in jail because he was preaching what thus saith the Lord. Not because he was preaching nationwide politics. Not because he was preaching stand against the government. Not because he was in rebellion. He's saying, this is what God said. His own people got him put down in the pit. And you know what happened? He got so bitter because the very people, just like the Apostle Paul, that he was trying to help are the very people that hurt him. And I know preachers that have tried to help the people that hurt them. And they're in a pit. Suppose that's what happens to you today. I like this part of the story because in this case, the Lord uses a human instrument to help an old preacher. Now, let me qualify what I'm about to say, and I'm not saying this sarcastically or self-serving, lest you think that it is self-serving. This isn't for you folks to do for me. But you know what he does? That preacher is sinking in the mire. That preacher is depressed. That preacher is discouraged. That preacher feels deserted. And that preacher is in a very, very dark place, just like Elijah was. And God didn't show up. Well, except in a man by the name of Ebed Melech, just a black servant, a nondescript, a non essential. No title, no position, no power, just a servant. He goes in and makes a supplication to the king and he said, King, I want to run something by you. I've heard that old man preach and uh, I think it might behoove you to consider that first of all, whatever he's prophesied has come true. And second of all, it's pretty obvious that the reason they don't like him is because he's told them what God said instead of what they wanted to hear. Probably a good man to have around. And the king says to Ebed, I'm giving you just a, a quick uh, bridged version of it. You know what the king said to Ebed? He said, well, what in the cat hair you want me to do about it? And he said, nothing. You don't have to sweat. You don't have to strain. You don't have to invent. All I need is your permission to get some ropes and some rags and some cast clouts and go pull him up out of that hole. Because he's in a hole. Ladies and gentlemen, it, it's not just preachers that get depressed and discouraged and in dark places in a time like this. And what I want you to see is, is a little bit of encouragement goes a long way. A rope of a text or a phone call or a letter or an email or some flowers, or some cookies. Just a brief, I'm praying for you. Ebed goes and gets his friend. The name won't come to me. I can't see it in my mind's eye right now. And they look down in that hole, slide that manhole cover out of the way, and they're looking and listening, and that light hits Jeremiah in the eyes. And he looks up there as much as he can without the stuff running into his ears, and he looks up and he's figuring, yeah, they're going to dump some more stuff on me. I know some preachers right now that are so discouraged and so downtrodden and in such a dark place that every time a little bit of light comes in, you know what they think? Nobody's here to help me, so they're going to dump on me again. I know some Christians. You know what they think? They're going to dump on me again. They're going to dump on me again. That's where he was. If you want it straight up and plain, he's down in the septic tank. He's down in the place where every filthy thing in that city runs off. He's down there and he's left to die. No way to crawl out. No way to get out. No way to get any relief. He's floating in sewage. I've seen pictures that are actual pictures of what happened, but I've also seen some movies of Auschwitz and Birkendahl and, and places like that. Akau and different places where kids would hide in the latrine, in the sewage, 
to avoid being burned alive. That's where Jeremiah is. And God didn't come down there miraculously or speak a voice ever, levitate him up out of the hole. You know what he did? He listened to him complain. He listened to him make a promise not to preach. And then after he said all those things, he just used a common, everyday, ordinary man with common, everyday, ordinary materials at his disposal. You'd be surprised, even though you wouldn't want it in a hospital bed, what some cast clout, some some support, some 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 padded, some padding is a better way to put it, like foam rubber and some rags. You'd be surprised for an old man that's stuck down in there that doesn't have the strength to pull himself up or to repel uh, or ascend out with a rope or whatever. He hollers down there and he said, Hey, preacher, and the preacher waits for it to come down on him, waits to hear the laughter, the cackles, and like hyenas and jackals laughing, he's waiting. And he doesn't hear it, and he looks up waiting, a little gun shy, and he said, Preacher, there's a rope down there. And Jeremiah said, What do you expect me to do with that? I can't pull myself up. I'm too weak. I'm too old. I'm too emaciated. I'm too hungry. I haven't had anything to eat. I haven't had anything to drink. It's been dark down here. He said, I... He said, no, preacher, I put a loop in that thing. And he said, well, you, my skin's old now and, and paper thin. And, and if I get that on there, you know what's going to happen? It's going to tear my skin to pieces and it's going to cause me a lot of pain. I just, he said, no, preacher, what I did was I, I sent you some rags. You know what I think those rags were? I think they're a picture of where Ebed came from. I think they're a picture of the pieces of the ship that came apart when Paul was in darkness in the hold of the ship, remember? And he said, be of good cheer. I I remember that ship came apart and he said, and some escaped on broken pieces. You know what I think those rags represent? I think he'd be saying, I've been right where you are, preacher. I've been downtrodden and discouraged. I've been disappointed by other people. I've been in darkness just like you. You know what he did? He let those things down and that old preacher looked at him and he said, now take those things and put them under your armpits there, preacher. And he said, now, if you'll just let us, we'll pull you up out of the, out of that miry clay, out of that mud hole and we'll get you out. Like that boy that used to use that snatch rope to get him out on the beach down in Atlantic Beach years ago like the prodigal in the pig pen who's in a distant land. You know what I have seen? I've seen people who have been prodigals starting to make their way back to the house. If anything, I've seen the virus, bad as it is, the trouble that it's caused, all that goes with it. You know what I've seen? I've seen some people go, you know what, I should go back to the Father's house. I ain't got no business being here. They're in the muck and the mire the same way Jeremiah was. What can you do as a Christian? You can just encourage others. If you happen to be listening to me and you're from another church, and you happen to have a pastor who right now doesn't have the ability to be able to live stream or put something out on audio or whatever, trust me when I tell you, he wants to. But you know what? It's a great time for you to send him a piece of rope and send him a little rag or something from your life, some clouts that just say, hey, preacher, we love you, we miss you, looking forward to getting together again. You'd be surprised what that'll do for a preacher that is down on the depths of the despair in a dark place. People in peril and prodigals that are stuck a long way off. You say, what happened? The Lord said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm coming to a close now if you can't tell. I hope that you've understood that in the message today I'm trying to convey a very important point that God can forsake a nation but He never forsakes His people. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Preacher, I'm not righteous. I know I have His righteousness nor His seed begging bread. Don't know where this is going to go. Don't know what's going to happen. I know this. It's a great time for spiritual 
looking at yourself inwardly. An evaluation, if you will, to see where you are. I know where I used to be. You know what happened? They'd come in, they'd call you in the office, and they'd say, okay, have a seat. And you sit across the table, and they give you all the warm fuzzies, and you've done this, and you've done that, and then they hit you with all the things you don't do right. That's called your evaluation. And if you get certain marks on your evaluation, you're entitled to a step raise. And if you don't get those marks on there, then your step raises. So the motivation, the carrot and the stick is, the motivation is, is that if I do good, I get a raise. If I keep doing what I need to do, I get a raise. But they have to have an evaluation process. When I was in with the FTO program and that kind of stuff, we had an evaluation process. And you evaluate an individual not by one thing they do, but by the whole picture of things. And so you have an evaluation. If they have an officer safety issue, you've you got to put a sheet in there and you have a, an evaluation. Every day they get an evaluation, an evaluation, evaluation. God help the individual who makes a decision on someone's life based on one day or one incident. And yet some of you today have already either made that judgment of others or you've made that judgment on yourself. I'm too dirty. Jeremiah was filthy, covered head to toe. God sent a servant to help him. Prodigal came to himself. As soon as he comes back to the door, he gets there to the door. Guess what happens? Because he was a long way off distance since I'm using D's. You know what he does? He comes up there and he sees that little fire flickering and those little candles burning. He smells mama's bread. And he starts there and he's thinking, man, what if he won't take me back? And he starts to go in and he gets just inside that gate right there and he starts to slow down. And he's thinking maybe in my mind's eye about turning around And man, you would think it was Dick Buckus from the Chicago Bears from back in years ago. All of a sudden, there's an old man, got him wrapped up, man, and gives him a bear hug. And you know what he says? He says, "Uh, I've sinned. He said, boy, I sure am glad to have you home, boy. I'm no more worthy to be called that. I sure am glad to have you home, boy. Daddy, you know what I've done, where I've been? where Lord, I, I don't deserve to be even called your son. I should just be a servant. Glad to have you home, boy. Glad to have you home, boy. You say, what happened? Even after all the mess he made in the pig pen, spent all of his substance on writer's life, you know what the Lord said to him? You know what the picture of the Lord is? What he'd do for you today? In spite of the peril, in spite of the trouble, in spite of the difficulty, he'll send that chariot by for you. He'll send that servant by for you. He'll come by himself and give you comfort that only he can give you. You know what he'll say to you? he says, say, I sure am glad to have you home. Get the robe and get the ring and get the shoes and kill the fatted calf. Because I'm just glad that you're back home. Would you consider with me today that maybe even if death were to get a hold of us, that we don't sorrow as others that have no hope? Even if we lose friends and we have and people that we know to this virus or, or as a result of the virus, that at that time in your life as a Christian, the greatest time that there is, the time where all the questions get answered, that He promises that I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you, even at death. Quick illustration and I'm done. The story is told, and I got this from another preacher. I wrote it down years ago. I never forgot it. He told it in such a vivid manner. He said there was a little girl dying. If I remember correctly, it was a blood disease. I want to say leukemia, but there was no question the little girl was dying. And there was no cure for what she had, for how she was dying, and they knew for a fact, even back in those days, that she was going to perish. And mom and dad are in the room there with her, and the little girl begins to get anxious and begins to get scared. She recognizes that things are not going to get better and that she's uh, going to pass on. And they try as best they can to explain about Uh, dying and going to heaven and and those kind of things. But she's a very young girl and she doesn't quite grasp everything. And so she looks at her daddy and she says to her dad, her physical daddy, she said, Daddy, you've always been with me. Everywhere I've ever gone and everything I've ever done, you've always been there for me. You remember that time, Daddy, I fell through the ice? You were right there. Remember that time I slipped and fell? Daddy, you were right there. Remember that time? And she recalled all those times. And her daddy said, Yes, I remember it. Yeah, it was yesterday. I remember it. She said, Daddy, can you go with me where I'm going? And the daddy grabbed the hand of the mama and clutched it very carefully and then reached out for his daughter's hand. And she, he said, honey, this is one trip daddy can't make with you. Well, the story is told that that little girl pouted. She got mad. She got 
not just frightened because her dad had all... She felt deserted. She felt left out. The dad began to cry. The mother began to cry. And the story is told the little girl turned her back on them and turned toward the wall. I'm not speaking to you. And time passed and the silence was deafening. And the buzz of the fluorescent lights and the coldness of the temperature and that what seems to be, no matter how much you dress it up with flour, it just seems like a tomb. And the concrete walls echoing and the rubber of the soles of the nurses and the doctors scraping across the floor, the only sounds that could be heard. And a dad with answers that he did not have to questions that even he didn't know. And the little girl turned over. And although there were salt stains running down her cheeks, her countenance had changed. And she said, Daddy. And before she could even finish the statement, he said, she said, Honey, I'm so sorry. I can't go with you. I, I wish I could explain it to you. I wish I understood. And she interrupted her daddy. You know what she said? Daddy, it's okay. Jesus said, He'd go with me. You know what I can tell you? I can't tell you about tomorrow politically, prophetically, or anything else, but I can tell you this. When the time comes, whether by death or rapture, Jesus can do something for you. No doctor, no nurse, no first responder, no soldier, your husband, your wife, your kids, He can do something for you that no one else can do. And when that time comes, if you're saved, you know what He said? I got this. You know what you can tell others? It's okay. He's going to go with me. Maybe you'd like to bow as I'm going to close in prayer, take just a moment or two to thank the Lord that through just some biblical illustrations that I can clearly see that no matter what my problem is, the Lord has a way that He hadn't forgotten me, He hadn't forsaken me. He's telling you to be strong and to be of good courage that He will not fail and He won't forget you. Heavenly Father, I would pray that you might bless this morning's service. Lord, thank you for those people that are so faithful that continue to come and they continue to listen and they continue to watch and they continue to encourage. We haven't given up hope yet, Lord. We don't know what it is that you're doing. We can't even make sense of it. But we sure are glad that no matter what that may be, that as far as our personal relationship with you, though it seems to be being tested now that we have the security of knowing that you'll never leave us and never forsake us. Lord, those people under the sound of my voice today, I'd pray that you might comfort them as only you can. I know they're afraid. I know they're uncertain. It's not that they're not spiritual, Lord. They're human. They haven't been through something like this before. Lord, keep the hyenas and the jackals off of them. Keep the folks making fun of them and trying to make political statements and draw in personal favors. Lord, keep them off of them and help them to settle in on you. Comfort them as only you can with the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and show them what they need in their personal lives that no preacher or no person can help. They need supernatural help from you. And once again, Lord, I pray for the heads of government I pray for the people from the White House all the way down, people in other countries, other nations that we tend to forget about. We have Christians in other places around the entire world. I pray for their leaders also, but I pray more importantly, Lord, for those people, those persons, those individuals that need help this morning and need strength this morning. I pray, Lord, that you'll calm their spirit down. And We'd ask these things and thank you once again for leaving the door open Though we may not like how we're having to do it, that we can still broadcast the message of hope that you've sent to us. Bless this service. Bless the people that have watched today, Lord, and help us to have wisdom as did Solomon in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.